So, good afternoon everyone. Today I'm going to give you the lecture about main principles of orthopedics, how to examine and treat our patients, and about the actual the fracture healing process, uh, about polytrauma and traumatic illness. So, uh, what actually, what kind of pathology we used to treat? First of all, that's bone fractures. Bone fractures of extremities, of pelvis, and spine. They go in various types. You will know today how to diagnose them and how to choose proper treatment according to the type of fracture. Next condition, dislocations. So, dislocations, also urgent condition. Bone is not fractured, but a joint is usually not functioning well and also uh, we're talking about soft tissue injuries as uh, tendons and ligaments so usually they will also impair function also uh, we used to treat deformities there may be deformities from birth or gain deformities deformities of extremities of spine and also such uh, joint disorders, mostly as osteoarthritis, on advanced stage, or maybe as spinal deformities and spinal diseases, so the most common, you know, uh, degenerative disc disease. So that's main our main job, what we do every day. And if we talk about our specialty, uh, we have many so-called narrow fields, we call them subspecialties. So uh, most of acute injuries, of course, are done by trauma surgeon. Uh, but uh, you know, the, there are peculiarities in treatment of some uh, specific locations. That's why we have subspecialty of foot and ankle, wrist and hand. Uh, for injuries of uh, vertebral column, there are also many, many specific points. Also uh, about joint replacement, as hip and knee joint replacement, and uh, a subspecialty about knee surgeries, particularly arthroscopic surgeries, that's maybe uh, quite a narrow field. So actual arthroscopy, maybe of knee joint, shoulder joint, hip joint, etc. And uh, treatment of tumors and pediatric conditions may be also as a subspecialty. So you see quite a huge variety of pathologies that we should treat. So the first one was uh, describing the techniques of treatment for dislocations, and uh, bone fractures was the prominent Greek physician Hippocrates. So he was a mathematician, he was a philosopher, and also he was a physician. His technique of uh, shoulder dislocation reduction we use still nowadays in our practice. If other methods are not working, we use our foot and put it in axillary region and pull this arm and using a heel trying to reduce the dislocation. So actually it's working. But also he introduced first devices made of wooden sticks and boards that were able to immobilize fractures. And uh, actually these are first written notes that we have to nowadays. Another Greek uh, philosopher and physician uh, Claudius Galenus he introduced the principles of surgical technique of uh, limb pathology. Uh, in the Middle East, we know Abu Ali ibn Sina, another name Avicenna. He wrote approximately 450 various books about different aspects of human being, but we're talking about 
this impact in medicine. So up to 40 of these canons were devoted to treatment and diagnostic of various diseases of human body and uh, bone pathology as well. So fractures in this location were described in this book. So these books were uh, textbooks for many universities around the world for centuries. We also have uh, a number of uh, physicians who made significant impact on traumatology and orthopedics and its development. So now we'll talk about this authorities. Uh, so 16th century, Ambroise Paré, uh, he was a military surgeon was the father of forensic pathology. Uh, he developed the techniques how to treat those injuries on the battlefield, so the wounds, so open fractures, contaminated. So uh, he, he described well these principles. He also was a bright anatomist and he uh, invented surgical techniques and surgical instruments. Uh, when we talk about the name of our specialty, two words, traumatology and orthopedia. So traumatology means science about the injury. Trauma means injury and sci logos means science. The word orthopedia was taken from the book that was written by Nicholas Henri. Uh, Orthos may means straight based child. So the book was written specially for for parents that were taking care about children with various deformities of limbs. And you see uh, as the tree which is bended and the stick straight stick is used to make this tree uh, straight. So that was the main principle of correcting of these deformities that day. Now we use many cases surgical techniques, but also this slow uh, but non-surgical way is also possible for many deformities. Uh, another French surgeon Lyon Dupuytren was also a bright anatomist and uh, till nowadays uh, he described uh, such pathology as fracture of malleolus, uh, fractures involving ankle joint. And now if you see an x-ray with a fibula fracture, which is about syndesmosis and fracture of medial malleolus, which are displaced, so we name this a Dupuytren fracture. Another pathology that he described, the treatment techniques as well, was a contracture, stiffness of fingers, hand, which in many cases requires surgical treatment. So Nikolai Ivanovich Pirohov, Ukrainian surgeon, is famous all around the world. Uh, he was a military surgeon. He was a bright anatomist. He described, uh, actually his scientific thesis, thesis was uh, about anatomy research. He made, uh, created many uh, atlases of human body. Uh, and uh, from a surgical point, he was, uh, his technique was brilliant. He was very quick and very precise in his work. And uh, he was the first actually who used uh, POP bandages to treat uh, fractures in, that are well in battlefield. He was also used the first general anesthesia to treat these patients. He was a great uh, teacher as well, and he knows that in the Vinica, we have his museum where he is, uh, where you can visit him. 
and to see to, to get more information about these activities. Uh, another uh, prominent surgeon from United Kingdom, Taxi Laporte, uh, he was famous for many scientific research about treatment of tumors, in particular malignant tumors and treatment of tuberculosis. We know that tuberculosis uh, is affecting not only the lungs, but is affecting vertebral column and uh, joints, particularly knee joint and hip joint. So uh, 18th century, this was very spreaded and was a great problem in the days. So he described how to treat this pathology and uh, also we know him uh, for, for treatment of fractures of ankle joint. So if you talk about a uh, three malleolar fracture, the anterior portion of tibia, particular surface or posterior portion, so we call it a pot fracture, or actual three malleolar fracture. Another uh, surgeon from uh, United Kingdom, from Wales, is uh, Duke Owen Thomas. Uh, we know him, most of all, we remember him for his splint. Till nowadays, we see more than 100 years, we use this splint to immobilize fractures of hip joint and uh, tumor. On our practical classes, you will see the splint, you will see how to apply this. And uh, actually, uh, his splint was developed first to treat tuberculosis uh, pathology of knee joint. But later, the First World War, uh, was uh, the splint was used in great amounts to save patients' limbs, low extremities, uh, were fractured. Uh, were immobilized by this limb and the mortality was significantly decreased. Another brilliant uh, surgeon also from United Kingdom, Robert Jones, he described uh, the fracture of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. Now we know the fracture as Jones fracture. So once dancing, he uh, got this fracture, and to prove that there is a fracture there, he used X-rays. So after that, X-rays become a routine procedure uh, that is used to diagnose fracture. Uh, Konstantin Sivash is an uh, orthopedic surgeon from Ukraine. Uh, that day it was Soviet Union, so Soviet Ukraine. Actually, he was born not far from Kyiv, on the top city, uh, Sumer region. So actually, he was the first who successfully implanted uh, artificial hip joint. So actually, there were some attempts before him, uh, but those were not successful. So he did his own, created his own prosthetic device and it was fixed without cement, without bone cement. Uh, actually he developed the technique as well and he made I think maybe some hundreds surgeries in, in Soviet Union and Europe and all around the world. Uh, the technique was quite complicated so there was no uh, many followers, but actually it was very reliable. So for some decades, uh, was an, an example on one conference, 34 years, was a woman with this uh, hip and still walking with no problem. The next uh, surgeon, uh, English orthopedic surgeon, who, who did uh, cemented total hip, so actually he used polymethyl metacrylate to fix uh, this uh, hip components uh, to the bone. Uh, John Chanley, uh, 
actually that fact made the surgery quite simple so till these days we use his technique and after him uh, after his clinical experience the surgery become became very popular in the United Kingdom in Europe and then all around the world so actually is the father of cemented cemented hip replacement and by the way these devices these implants like there are some modifications but actually it looks the same the polyethylene acetabulum and stainless steel or prosthetic device till, till nowadays we use this in our in our clinical practice also we should note that he wrote a book about conservative fracture treatment and he is considered to be a father of British orthopedics. Uh, next famous person is Gavriel Avramovich Ilizarov. So he is famous for his Ilizarov frame. Uh, actually, he is very famous all around the world because this frame gives the possibility to save limbs. So very huge injuries, which are open injuries when tissues are crashed so this uh, device helps to heal the wound and to heal the fracture if the limb is short it may be used to make it longer if the fracture is not healing it may be used to heal it by principles of compression and distraction actually his scientific work was about his research was was about that about compression and distraction osteosynthesis. So now let's talk about basic principles, how to examine our patient and how, based on this diagnosis, how to choose proper treatment. So you know the scheme, you know the algorithm. So first you should talk with the patient and collect specific complaints that will help you to find the area which was injured and uh, to know about circumstances how the injury was happened was it a falling just walking falling down or was it a car that hits the pedestrian or was it a falling from the height like a high energy injury so also you need to know about the mechanism, it was it direct or indirect, we'll talk about this a little bit later. So all these facts together with the time, how much time has passed from the moment of injury to application and uh, all this treatment that was performed before, you see the patient, all this will help you a lot to make correct diagnosis and to choose correct treatment plan so from general examination first of course we need to know if patient patient general condition or it may be satisfactory poor may be agonic even and uh, the main points you should check first of all you should check uh, his consciousness you should should check presence of the pulse and pulse rate and the level of blood, blood pressure particularly we need systolic blood pressure to very quickly to estimate general condition of our patient we perform our examination of all parts of the body limbs lens of the limbs a presence of deformities shortening of the limb etc the axis of the limb is a change or not uh, uh, vertebral column, spine as well. So, and also we need to check how muscle tonus is present. We have uh, some specific symptoms that are uh, and can can help us to perform differential diagnostics. So fractures, you remember that if we see a deformity, gross deformity of the limb that was not present before the injury if you see 
mobility in this unusual place, not in the joint, but in the mid shaft, let's say, or you have a crepitation, your crepitation on the injured side. So you assure them that the fracture is present. And some additional clinical symptoms like swelling, present for every fraction, uh, hematoma, also bruising, local tenderness, uh, function is decreased, joints, movement are restricted. So all this also will help you, will help you together with main clinical symptoms, it will help you to make correct diagnosis. And then we'll go to the additional methods of investigation. So note that first we need to examine patient physically and only then we should go to x-ray and not vice versa. So on the slide you can see x-ray which is done according to the rules and of course you need to know how to perform x-rays correctly. So you see that we have AP view and lateral view uh, two views are mandatory, not only one view, but two views. Uh, we need to put the side where you think the fracture is, on the middle of the film. Here it is, so you check physical symptoms of fracture. You see that there is deformity here. You feel crepitation. Yes, you see that uh, this area is mobile, you can move on this area and you put the film under the patient's leg and make x-rays. Straight AP view from anterior to superior. This one, you see the leg is straight, it's not rotated, yes, same as here. And straight lateral view, which is perpendicular to AP view. You see straight lateral view here. So that's minimum that you are doing. Some locations you need more, some locations, wrist joint for example, scaphoid fracture, you need 45 degree oblique view. For calcaneus, for talus, sometimes for pelvis you need additional views, so, but two views you should do in all cases. Also, we should see the joint which is close to the fracture you make a short film like that one, you may don't see the joint and you don't know is there a fracture in the joint or not. That's why you need to make long film. It should involve the nearest joint to the fracture. And I would say if you have this two bone segment like tibia and fibula, you should take long film from one joint knee joint and to the ankle joint. And the reason for that is very simple. One bone may be fractured on one level, like lower third, and another may be above and you can miss the structure. That's why two bone segments from one joint to another joint, long film should be, should be taken. We have uh, several other examinations like CT scan, which we need mostly for fractures that are intraarticular, like when articular surface is involved and comminuted. We are going to repair it, so we need to know about the position of each bone fragment to put it on its place. We may use a CT scan if we have some infection, some bone tissue is destroyed. If you have bone tumors, well, if uh, we have a fracture which is or on the areas which are hard to hard to or to see on X-ray, let's say foot, so many bones. If you do lateral view, you can see something. If you do a AP view, all bones are together, so you need axial view. Uh, also, you don't see a lot of information, some oblique views, so it's better to make a CT scan. For fracture of talus, fracture of calcaneus, if you see that it is 
uh, displays so better to do in second location next location may be uh, pelvic fractures that are also that are also not you can miss something if it is uh, unstable fracture and the same about vertebral column so also CT scan is a bit different uh, if we talk about MRI mostly we don't use this to diagnose fractures but ligaments the joint capsule some inf uh, inflammation of the joint like synoviitis for example you can see the capsule well you can see amount of fluid you can see is knee joint like let's say meniscus are they intact or not and cruciate ligaments uh, and so on that's the main purpose why you can use it and also if we talk about osteoarthritis you can show us the state of cartilage and how it is destroyed and this bone area under the cartilage, subchondral bone, yes, so sometimes you may find some destruction there. That's our main problem. Okay, uh, if we put here ultrasound, um, many think not important, yes, it's not for bones, yes, it's not for bones, for, but that's for joints, and knee joint can be well examined by ultrasound some other joints as shoulder joints and the hip as well and particularly we are talking about uh, new bones uh, they the few few weeks it's not good to make an x-ray but you if you think about congenital hip dysplasia or dislocation and uh, you you can't make x-rays because it's harmful but ultrasound is safe and you can see much more you can see the cartilage you can see antiversion of the femoral head its position the femoral head is it on the in the joint or not so you can see even much more information than by by x-rays and it's non-invasive it's safe for a child so ultrasound why not arthroscopy so i think that's invasive method yes but you can see with your eye what is happening in the joint you can see that meniscus is it torn or not you can see the state of capsule and even some debridement of the joint so all these things are possible and we can combine uh, diagnostics and treatment that's advantage in, the, in one procedure yes so not like today we are making ar arthroscopy for diagnostics and tomorrow the same for treatment. No, one procedure should be should have all necessary uh, supplements to perform uh, like meniscectomy, partial meniscectomy, or to perform uh, ACL grafting, for example. Okay, lab analysis. It it gives us some something like it's not like so important for us like to diagnose pneumonia for example but still we can we can do something for for, for massive uh, injuries with blood loss of course you see this uh, anemia and you may see some inflammation general signs of inflammation of uh, erythrocyte pigmentation rate and leukocyte may be increased but actually uh, that's quite limited application about fractures no, no specific changes to have that so if we talk about bacteriological screening that yes for infection for infection complications sometimes we should aspirate this parts and uh, from joint if you do it called arthrosynthesis and we can perform bacteriological screening for that for this last method, we use mostly for neoplasmas, for tumors, to differentiate malignancy, malignant or benign tumors. So quite rare in our clinic, but uh, it's possible. Another method of therapy. So now let's talk a few words about joints, because actually the function in limbs mostly 
like due to joints yes if they're working properly the function is good if there are some limitations like stiffness contractures so that's maybe a problem so if we talk about types of joints yes you see maybe a mono x joint like hinge joint interphalangeal joints or elbow one part of it is a uh, hinge joint so flexion extension we don't have abduction for example okay. so if we talk about biaxial joints yes so we have some of them like in the wrist you can move it like flexion uh, extension adduction and abduction but we have also a three axial joints like shoulder and hip and here we can do all range of motion flexion extension adduction abduction ro rotation so how this movement look like so we have neutral position zero degrees and from this neutral position moving forward means flexion moving backward means extension yes extension and hyperextension the same about elbow joint so i don't think that hyperextension in elbow joint but some some people can do this for a few degrees same about cervical level spine is possible this joint you see the example here so next movement well illustrated like movement let's imagine the line this line of the body moving from the body central line we call it abduction if we move the leg or the arm to the midline we call this adduction so remember abduction and adduction so we use this quite a lot in our practice and that's possible also for fingers so adduction adduction in fingers and we perform a position as well when the first finger is moved to the fifth here we have a second duction so it's actual combination of all types like flexion extension rotation and uh, adduction one term more that you should remember this is supination and pronation so supination is a rotational movement which is external and pronation is performed internal so remember again supination and pronation well 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 remember i can uh, about you can remember about head hand position so this position supination palm is up supination palm is down okay we have next movement it's aversion in inversion rotation outside and inside that's for foot because it's not purely rotation it's like a, a little bit changing its axis so that's why a specific movement for for and we don't and we we're talking about ankle flexion we call it dorsiflexion northern surface and plantar flexion which is called uh, uh, actually uh, ankle extension and again about proposition it's what we do in our everyday life this finger to the third actually that's adduction and flexion of the first finger combining with flexion of the fifth finger for neck we're talking about flexion to one side and another we call it lateral flexion so that was about movement now we should uh, go to the looking at the extremity shape and to see is the uh, arm or leg straight or not or it is deformed we should draw the line which is the central line we call it axial line and all joints should be extended and if 
in this extension position the central line goes through the middle three main points like head of humerus capitulum or head of radius and eloid process this straight line goes through it and the rotation and all movements are not impaired if we talk about some uh, deformity on this slide we can see the deformity that's when elbow joint is fully extended so we see actually the angulation which is open to the lateral side or angulation which is open to the middle side so these two types of deformity we call it a cubitus elbow joint so cubitus valgus and cubitus varus about low extremity axial line goes through the spina iliac anterior superior through the patella yes maybe edge of patella maybe the center of the patella and to the space between the first and second finger toes so look when we have two types of deformity one when knee joint is in the middle part of this line and the knee joint is out of this line so actually we are talking about valgus knee and varus knee if it is bilateral we may say o-shaped lap bilateral genu varum and x-shaped leg like letter x is bilateral genu valgus a uh, practical saying that is possible for after fractures of condyles femoral condyle or tibial head it may be possible when ligaments are ruptured and may be possible uh, when a uh, newborn child re repetes uh, this kind of deformity and if Mm, severe stages of advanced stage of osteoarthritis also sometimes we have valgus ovarus deformity uh, that we should correct in our surgical treatment usually so let's go on and talk about the length of extremity you know that upper extremity consists of two segments that's humerus and fora. We may measure the total length of upper extremity. That's from acromion till the tip of the third finger. The arm is in an anatomical position. Uh, and uh, if we uh, take these measurements, of course, the, the important point is to do it bilaterally on one side and another side of course few measurements like to say 60 centimeters one side gives you nothing but if you see one side 60 and another 55 say so you understand that one limb is shorter and it should be the same so perhaps some kind of pathology mm, this patient has so about humerus, we take this bony landmark as acromion again, and from this side it may be lateral epicondyle, or maybe tip of olecranum as well. So that will be the length of humerus. And the length of forearm, again, may be better from the tip of olecranum, to steroid process of Ulm. And again, you're doing on the, you're measuring on the other side. About low extremity. What you should remember, how to find this landmark, that's usually pina iliaca anterior superior. And distally you see the tip of medial malalus. That's your straight line that you should measure and uh, compare from 
other side. As the lens of femur, you should palpate the tip of greater trochanter and gap of the knee joint. The lens of tibia, tip uh, from the uh, gap of the knee joint to the tip of the lateral malleolus. That's how to measure it on the lower extremity. So that's a short algorithm for diagnostics. So when you see a patient with injury, first of all, you need to de determine is it just soft tissue injury or the bone is involved. So to know that, you, you know already uh, symptoms. If you check the symptoms, you'll have the answer. So first of all, you look, if you see the deformity is present, so perhaps that is a fracture or maybe a dislocation also goes with deformity. If there is no deformity, so perhaps there is no fracture, but there is no fracture which is displaced. But it is possible when there is a fracture which is not displaced. So that you should keep in mind. So, but Deformity, presence of deformity tells you that something wrong happened. Bone shape is changed and usually uh, that fracture is displaced. Second, you check this local area of the pain is. So if you feel mobility, that bone fragments are movable, that you're sure the fracture is present. If you don't see this, perhaps there is no fracture. And the third thing, you check uh, crepitation. If you're moving bone fragments and you feel crepitus, crepitation, perhaps the fracture is present. Or if no, there is, there is no fracture. So for, for fractures that are not displaced, you can apply a lot along the axis of extremity. Talking about femur, you can raise it up, back and apply a lot for the hammering, for example, with the heel. And that will, try, will help you to diagnose if the pain is increasing in the femur, so it's broken. If a pain is only where you're hammering, like foot, no, no fracture you should. So that's first you should differentiate, because if no fracture, one treatment. If there is fracture, another treatment. If the fracture is displaced, usually the treatment is more complicated. Maybe a, a reduction or surgery, or close reduction, the general anesthesia. If the fracture is not displaced, treatment is more simple as usual. Usually you just need to fix, to immobilize to prevent movement. That's it. That's more simple because it is usually performed without without taking patient to a hospital. Just applying a POP and patient go home. And the last you should determine if there is a fracture, yes, yes, so displaced or not, and then is it open or closed? And that's again a challenge. If it is open fracture, infection is inside. Infection may develop there. It may become infected. It may become affecting the fracture healing either because infected wound with a fracture usually don't heal. That's why we have two types. We have when fracture is made with a bone fragment from inside outside and it, call, and it is damaging the skin, fascia, subcutaneous tissue and causing the wound. And maybe when impact is, is performed from outside in heavy object is damaging skin, subcutaneous tissues and damaging the bone.
we have also the other type of injuries what they're coming for joints so on the left side there's a dislocation so what is the dislocation you see the part of joint ahead particularly goes out of the joint so here we have glenoid and articular surface of humeral head so we have a loss of contact because the humeral head goes out of the glenoid cavity and there is no contact between glenoid cartilage and humeral cartilage so that's official definition for dislocation when there is total loss of contact between two articular surfaces and that's usually when head goes out of the joint side we have another condition when it goes down in the shoulder joint for example it goes down but it's still in the joint in the capsule of the joint but just it's displaced a little bit so this will we, call, we would call a subluxation when particularly part of the articular surface is in contact but part is not so a subluxation is very different from this location because uh, usually it, it can be corrected more easily and uh, the reason for that is mostly not the injury for uh, shoulder joint but maybe problems with the uh, neurological problems that are innervating the capsule due to this the tonus is less and it goes down also another condition is a sprain ligaments and uh, which are stabilizing the joint maybe every joint ankle joint is shown here knee joint as well so it goes in different grades according to the full and turn of this uh, ligaments or partial turn of this ligament. Of course, this affects on the function of extremity and affects its stability. So now let's talk about main causes of trauma. So we define two types of force application. First, very good picture hammer and the nail and a fracture of the nail phalange so actually very simple explanation of direct force which was applied here another simple or direct uh, violence is when patient is falling on the elbow olecranum as and it is fractured if you talk about indirect that's a little bit different mechanism you see the leg the foot is twisted and the tibia and fibula are fractured above it so that force is applied to the foot and the fracture appeared to the other part when the bone is weak actually that's quite common uh, and uh, it's common also for dislocations On the right side, you can see a pattern for which is common for uh, so-called fractures of rectus. So, if a person was not trained a lot and then he suddenly starts walking for large distances, he's marching maybe 25 kilometers per day, 30 kilometers per day, and this a repeated cyclic load is causing the damage the damage to the bone that's common for the second third or fourth metacarpal bone fusion sometimes it goes without displacement sometimes it's like pain and uh, patient is not making x-rays but then accidentally making x-rays see a fracture is there so but usually the function is impaired and we have one uh, 
uh, pattern when uh, we call it a pathological fracture means uh, fracture is a pathology but we call it pathological fracture because the bone is changed due to the pathological process let's say you have a tumor or you have osteoporosis severe osteoporosis bone is brittle and any any small let's say force applied like maybe uh, moving the leg yes or applying some load on the leg not falling at all and cause a fracture so that's what we have if you have patient which causes a fracture without any like falling down or any heat on this area we usually think first of all maybe pathological fracture and again usually severe osteoporosis or leukemia or some infection in the bone can lead to pathological fracture so uh, now we can discuss a uh, quite important question about uh, bone regeneration so we have two types first or uh, let's say so-called physiological regeneration so normally bone is given structure and it is uh, in its living within all humans life the old bone is changed to new one uh, we don't think about it we don't think about that but that is uninterrupted process we know that osteoclasts cells are responsible for losing the bone tissue and on this area when uh, old bone tissue was removed osteocytes and osteoblasts are building new tissue so this process is going within a whole human's life we call it a physiological regeneration and we have another type we call it pathophysiological bone regeneration when bone is repaired is repaired when it was fractured uh, that's what we call a fracture healing so we know that bone uh, is a very uh, hard tissue and can't be repaired so easily like like skin yes it takes quite a long period of time sometimes weeks and months and it goes in several stages so we have these stages on my side it starts of course from uh, local bleeding accumulation of blood formation of hematoma is organized in a blood clot later few first few days and we have formation of soft colors and hard colors which are actually the bone already which is ossified and we still have the last stage which which we called the modern so no more structure is rebuilt so we have clinically evidence of healing when you see the patient with the hot color this process is going on later but still already the patient can use his knee can step on this foot or can move his arm when we see the formation of hot color which is irregular bone tissue so that's how this uh, phase is going on so we're talking about this first initial stage when we have hematoma and then biological substances are going to this area trying to repair this tissue we have formation of so-called mesenchymal tissue and different cells are coming to this area we know actually at this moment up to 50 substances that are taken part in this process 
but actually uh, there's much more, much many. So now we know about BMPs like BMP2, BMP7 that are important, alpha necrotic factor tumors. We have uh, substances that are uh, involving uh, like these areas, they are uh, improving blood supply to these areas. So actually we call this phase of inflammation, but that's inside exercise. It's not like inflammation uh, of the limb, like you say, with redness, swelling, uh, redness, uh, pain, and uh, inflammation due to on superficial nerve. Yeah. This is going inside of the fracture site. And in this process, blood clot is uh, replaced with a connective tissue, with a fibrous tissue, with a cartilage tissue. And then uh, we, we say it a soft cover is formed. And uh, still, some movement is possible, like bending one side a little bit. Uh, but then ossification of this cartilage is going on and uh, wound bone is formed. And then we see up to 70% of all time it's a remodeling phase. So sometimes it takes a year, a year and a half of, rem of big bones like tumor. So actually we have three slides that showing you how this process is going on. So see, bro bone is broken. Of course, there are some vessels in the bone and surrounding the bone, and we have formation of hematoma. Big hematoma is good because it is surrounding the bone ends, and after it is organized, it is already some kind of fixation. When this hematoma clot, blood clot, is changed to connective tissue. Also, we have already some soft cover there. And in this ossification process, this uh, uh, tissue are filled with calcium and become visible on each skin. Still, when we have uh, this uh, soft cover, we don't see it on X-ray. That's a problem. We can feel that fracture is not moving so as it was before, still bending a little bit, but we don't see the cartilage colors on X-ray. We can see only uh, hard colors, which is woven bone on X-ray. Another way of healing is uh, when we don't have colors at all, uh, we call it a direct healing or endo-ostal healing. Or maybe a callus which is periostal and a direct healing when the bone is in growing from one bone fragment into another one. So called osteons, they are growing directly. That's why we call direct healing from one bone fragment into another one. And from this part, they're growing from this fragment to this one. That's, that is possible, but we need to create special conditions for that. First, the gap should be very small. Big gap between fragments, no direct healing. We are talking about 150, 100, 200 micrometers, so it is less than millimeter. This short distance should be between bone fragments. There, is, there should be absolute stability, no movement at all, because if movement is present, no healing between these bone fragments. And I will tell you more, if movement is present, there is a resorption of bone in this interface and the gap between becomes larger becomes one millimeter becomes two millimeters few millimeters and there is no healing 
there. That's why it is so important to immobilize fracture. Even non-displaced fracture, but you should immobilize to prevent this resorption and to, to heal, to achieve direct healing. Uh, and one more condition, which we do by surgical treatment, by compression plate, to compress this area, this uh, bone fragment, and this we should compress them together. That's actually, that's actually uh, will help for direct healing. And if it happens, we may see no big callus, or we may see no callus at all. So this callus will be seen only if we have big fracture gap, we have some movement, micro movement, and if we have uh, okay, big hematoma around. So remember that on X-rays, sometimes the fracture may heal without without formation of big callus. So of course there are many factors that are affecting the fracture healing. Uh, some of them help fracture healing, others delay healing, make healing impossible even. On this slide I put you main factors which are harmful, which will delay fracture healing and which may cause a problem with your patient. So if very high energy was applied to the fracture, so tissues are severely damaged, blood supply is severely damaged. If it is open fracture, also bad thing. But this will heal heal longer or may don't heal at all. So second very harmful factor is the fracture. If you remember, if you want to heal the fracture, you should irrigate the fracture. Healing in the infection wound very long may even don't heal fracture may don't heal and uh, of course that's our primary aim to prevent infection or to eradicate infection segmental fractures my classes many time i show you double fracture so that's a case when one of these fractures may don't heal. If you have a segment between bone, main bone fragment, so there may be problem. For pathological fractures, osteoporotic bone, we have scientific data that shows that fracture in many cases, the healing is longer, uh, up to 40% of uh, osteoporotic fractures need longer time for healing. Also for tumors, when bone tissue is destroyed, also we may expect problems with healing. Interposition of soft tissues between main fracture fragments. That will also cause problems with healing. Because no contact between bone fragments. That's how it may don't heal. Problems with blood supply. That is a very well known problem. And we know that there are some areas, some bones, or parts of bone, that heal not very well. Let's say uh, femur. If the fracture happens in the femoral neck, the fracture may expect problems with healing. Many of these don't heal, and if they heal, need long time. If the fracture happens in the area of trochanters, per trochanteric fracture, so usually it heals well because we have very good blood supply there. For femoral neck, it, if it's fractured, all patient, we may expect actually non-healing there. Many systemic di disease, uh, endocrinal disease, 
problems with vessels, problems from comorbidities, infection, and so on and so on, um, they may cause late him. Malnutrition as well. If the patient is using corticosteroids, even I would say even non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, very continuous use may delay healing. Remember that for corticosteroids, they the use of them itself use uh, cause osteoporosis, but also it it cause problems with healing. Uh, we're talking about yet organic reasons as well. If not properly proper treatment was performed, it can cause non-healing. And if we have a distraction of the fracture site, also pulling these uh, bone fragments apart may cause a delayed healing. So there are some periods of fracture healing when it is possible and necessary, but in the final stages that may cause problems with healing. So we have three main problems with fractures. First, when fracture is healing in a poor position. So let's say the deformity was not corrected. We have angulation, we have rotation of the wind. We call it a healing as malunion. So in many cases, we need to correct the plate. Delayed union, when fracture is healing, but very long. So we have average time for fracture healing for every fracture location. We know that, let's say, distal radius fracture will heal in four weeks. So if four weeks have passed, we don't see healing, we may wait a week or two. If no healing, so we are talking about delayed he delayed union. Uh, that's a problem. Sometimes we need to stimulate. Remember, we were talking about uh, BMPs, like injection of BMPs or mesenchymal stroom cells. They can be used, or some other factors. That are such. We inject this, and that will help us. Sometimes. When we put bone graft, it can also have a good effect, like stimulating fracture healing. Non-union, it's another term. When fracture has not healed, we are waiting quite long. We're usually talking about double period of time, which is needed for healing. And there is no healing. That's, we're talking about formation of pseudoarthrosis or power joint. So if we talk about uh, how it looks like, we defined actually two types. We have a hypertrophic non-union and we have atrophic non-union. In hypertrophic non-union, we see a callus, but we see still the fracture line with bone fragments. And that's how we understand that fracture has been healed. If we talk about atrophic non-union, that's another example. We see that no callus here. We see that the end bone ends are are changed, uh, osteoporotically changed, yeah. and period of time has passed. No signs of healing at all. No formation of callus here. That's that's what we're talking about. Uh, atrophic non-union. Okay, and now let's go to main principles of treatment. I want to show you uh, what should we do as test ma pre-hospital management. So, at first medical aid, uh, this main point should be performed. We should immobilize, prevent movement, should 
is energetic. Here there is a drink which stop bleeding. To prevent swelling, increase of swelling, you should put arm as possible or left as, pos as high as possible. Put eyes here. IV infusions, if you have two or three fractures, a humeral fractures or wound with bleeding. And take patient to a hospital as soon as possible. Call ambulance. If you are ambulance and you're doing all these steps and go into the hospital, you will be hospital. That's how it looks like. In practical classes, we'll talk more in detail. But note that we have cleans, uh, maybe factory made, if you don't have it, maybe a slim. And you should pad it well to protect soft tissues. And I tell you many times that two joints should be fixed. A fracture of forearm, you should fix the splint above the elbow joint and below the wrist joint. If humerus is fractured, so splint should go above the shoulder joint and below the elbow joint. This splint, oh, the name is Kramer wire splint, used for low extremities. You may use two of them on posterior side one, one on the lateral side, and one on the middle side. Or it's better to use a bitter exclusion. That's part of the splints. And how it looks like application. Note that traction splint. Can you use rope? Stick, you can apply some tension along the axis of the extremity and then fix it with bandage with this. So uh, when patient is in the hospital, we have two ways. We can perform non-surgical treatment and we can perform surgical treatment. And uh, that's, that is actually the algorithm with all possible options. So please look very carefully at this uh, algorithm. Of course, we start from advanced trauma life support. Yes, if needed. If no needed or performed successfully, we go to our examination. We talk with the patient, we perform physical examination, and if you see symptoms, or we need to exclude uh, possible fractures, we perform an X-ray. Have, have four options. Let's start from this one. Like no bone pathology in X-ray. That's very good. You don't need POP. You don't need to immobilize mostly. Well, for some soft tissue injuries, we still apply a brace for a week or two. But uh, if tendon is ruptured, we need to repair it. If it's sprain or hematoma, just you know, rest and go to rehabilitation. Usually a week or two is enough. Another option, we have a dislocation. Remember, bone is not fractured, but we need to put this part of the, the bone to the joint cavity. So usually we call this a reduction procedure. This may go as open way and close. But close, that's what we do. Uh, open is for complicated cases, like you can't do it in close way, and it's quite rare, or it's very it's old case, like few weeks have passed, we consider more than three weeks, old case, you should not do it close, you should do it open. After reduction, X-ray again, please note, Harris X-ray before your treatment and after reduction, X-ray, and then immobilization and rehabilitation. That was about dislocation. And we have these two parts of the scheme, uh, both about fractures. Yeah, you made the X-ray, you see fracture. You look at the patient with wound, so open fracture. So what should we do? We should clean the wound, debride it, remove foreign bodies. We should give antibiotics. We should 
apply drainage approximate skin edges but no closure meaning until it will heal and usually we go in this way we use external fixator like Elizaro frame or other type of external fixator for for first and second grade if it's clean wound possible internal fixation possible and with some implants that are fixing bone and heal the healing till the bone fracture will heal and then patient go to the rehabilitation for non-clean case we usually fix use external fixators till the fracture is healed or we may combine won't become clean we may use open reduction internal fixation that was for open fracture and the most common situation we have closed fractures so uh, if it is displaced we need to reduce it and make an x-ray again so x-ray here and x-ray after reduction if a reduction is satisfactory you just immobilize it with a brace or POP making few x-rays on all this period until it heal in a few, few months so you do it uh, in a week then in a month and every three months then if it has healed the patient goes to rehabilitation it has not healed the snake x-ray has not healed so you have problems with healing like mentioned above non-healing or delayed healing you need to stimulate you may perform surgery with bone grafting or injecting PRP BMP injecting it and then it will heal and then to rehabilitation that was satisfactory reduction yeah? if unsatisfactory reduction so it goes to open reduction tunnel Again, it goes in this way. The X ray healed rehabilitation, X ray is not healed, the patient goes. That's actually all our treatment for injuries uh, are described in this here. You know this, you know correct management. So I put here four main goals. So when we have patient with injuries, first, of course, we are doing measures to save patient's life no doubt yes then we should save the extremity it's injured it's also no doubt then the third goal okay, if these two are achieved to restore anatomy as good as possible practical to repair it to reduce it to put it on its place this three are achieved then we should restore the function or rehabilitate that's our short but very important algorithm for patients with injuries okay and that's we're talking about uh, main types of non-surgical treatment and main types of surgical treatment so immobilization skeletal traction now i'll show you just pictures more in details we'll talk about this on second lecture about principles of treatment and internal external fixation and some orthopedic surgery so that's how pop look like posterior cast or secular bandage maybe but to put it on its place we should perform a reduction and it is made by hands we call it manual reduction or it made by special devices so that's how it's made by hand we are pulling it three stages traction pulling it then correction or reduction and fixation first we're keeping it by hands then we're applying a pop in the corrected position another way uh, you use special device this is sokolovsky device in other countries you may have different names for this but the idea is one part is pulled one side this is pulled in another side 
by this device and you can correct this interface and apply a POP in this device. And that's how skeletal traction for upper extremity looks like and for lower extremity looks like. More in details, it's important question. We'll talk next next lecture here. That's for lower extremity. Note that we need specific places where we put K wire. We can't put it through here or through the middle of the shaft. No, that's a better idea, very bad idea. Only specific places when you have just skin and bone. The, these are these places actually. I'm talking about calcaneus, talking about tibial tuberosity, supracondyle area, olecranum, and above sinus mons. And about surgical treatment, we're talking about, uh, we call it open reduction and internal fixation. So it has advantages because we can restore anatomy, but we have disadvantages, high rate of infection, implant cost, and so on. These are common indications. Note, for intraarticular fractures that are displayed, we should do it. Uh, if we need early motion, early rehabilitation, unstable displaced fractures of the shaft also, some fractures, displaced fractures like femoral head, neck, talus, they require surgery. And now quite a relative indication is we use, we may use both methods, non-surgical, surgical, we may use internal fixation to rehabilitate our patients earlier. So main implants that we may use, k wires, screws, plates with screws, intramedullary nails, and now new developing direction by degradable dice. So screws, you see how they look like in different types. We fix tibial head, we may oblique, fix oblique fractures with screws, but mostly screws are used together with the plate. Very thin K wires can be used alone for fingers or bundle or for fixing of olecran. But mostly screws are used together with plates. So see, the plate is fixed to the bone with screws above the fracture and below the fracture. And intramedullary nails, they go in different types, uh, for femur bone, for humerus bone, if traced of tibia, after internal fracture fixation with intramedullary nail. And specific nail, like hammer nail, for torchanteric fractures. Note that they are locking nail, locking uh, screws are used to fix them better. And Elizaro frame, that is external fixator. So this is the type of external fixator, which is uh, fixing on one side. So we have a frame here, rods are inserted uh, and fixing, fixing the fracture. Usually we use this for open fractures. So we can clean the wound, we can dress the wound very well when we apply uh, external fixators and uh, we can use them also for patients with polytrauma. So open fractures, we need to clean the wound, the bridement, we need, we can do it like through the window in the bandage, like secular bandage, POP was applied and then a window and through this window we can clean the wound. And if everything is okay, we move to the rehabilitation part. And this rehabilitation part involves gradual activity. Uh, so we move joints, we give patients some support, not to apply significant force to this area. And uh, that's a whole science because you need to know how much uh, load can be applied on each stage of fracture healing. And that depends from the fracture type and that depends from the implant that was used. 
so students that's all for now as